Rico Abreu strikes during Pennsylvania Speed Week, and we'll talk about his recent struggles in the sprint car, plus Summer Nationals results, news from Dirt Vision, and what exactly is Toth Racing. Let's go. Today is a Wednesday, June 29th. I almost said Tuesday, 2022. Welcome into Dirt Tracker Daily. I'm Justin Fiedler. At Grandview Speedway last night, Pennsylvania Speed Week continued, and the feature turned into a dominant performance from Rico Abreu. He started on the pole and uh, was able to keep Christopher Bell, Anthony Macri, and Brent Marks at bay for the duration of the event. The $10,000 score was Abreu's first victory of the year and first with crew chief Ricky Warner. Macri ended up second and extended his Pennsylvania Speed Week points lead to 84 over Marks. Uh, he rounded out the podium. Justin Peck is still third in the standings after finishing seventh last night. Seabell finished fifth, and Kyle Larson was out before halfway when something broke on his 57 machine, and he ended up tipped over. Speed Week uh, up in Pennsylvania uh, continues tonight at Port Royal, uh, and then they've got stops at Hagerstown, Williams Grove, back at Port, and Sealands Grove still to come through the weekend. Tonight's racing is on Flow Racing, and we've been talking about this kind of bouncing around of PA Speed Week on the streaming services, but with the racing tonight at Port, you will be able to watch on Flow Racing. Back to Rico, though, he's a driver we've seen uh, have a ton of success in the past around the country, including earning both outlaw and all-star wins, plus victories at Knoxville. He's got wins at the Chili Bowl, obviously, and elsewhere. But things have been tough in recent seasons uh, in the sprint car, and I think he hoped that hiring uh, Ricky Warner this season would turn those difficult uh, difficulties around pretty quickly. And remember that Ricky was available because Tony Stewart shelved his 14 car at TSR, and Ricky was free to go elsewhere. But so far with Ricky, it hasn't been easy going. Rico's only two all-star appearances were at Port Royal in May, uh, where he didn't transfer from the B-Main on the first night, and he ended up 25th in the feature on the second night after starting on the pole. In outlaw competition, he's made 24 starts and hasn't been terrible. And remember, they're kind of working up, uh, running a lot more outlaw races in hope of, uh, hopes of going full-time outlaw racing in the future. In the starts this year, though, he's got four top fives with good runs at Tulare, Bristol, and The Grove. But over his last nine races, he has just two top 10 finishes. His average uh, finish for the season in features is 10.54, which again, not terrible. But Rico is a driver that I think in past iterations of himself could have competed regularly in the top five on a nightly basis with the Outlaws. But as uh, I've said before, it, uh, it's been a tough few years for him. And Rico hasn't won an official Outlaw show since Gold Cup in 2018 and hasn't led laps either. So you're talking about almost four years. He did have a prelim win at Knoxville in 2021, but remember, those races don't count as official outlaw events. On the flip side, though, I have six seasons worth of outlaw races in the DirtTracker.com analytics database for Rico, and these 24 shows this season are by far the best he's done, even without winning. His average uh, time trial position is much improved, and his average feature finishes better as well. He's only been in a single B main. He's made every single feature, has more heat race wins than any previous year already, and he's also been in quite a few dashes. So even though it might not be super evident, Warner does appear to have made Rico better this season. After the, uh, the victory last night, Rico mentioned his tough week at Houston's, where his best finish was an 11th on Thursday night, and said he and Warner talked a lot on the drive from South Dakota to Pennsylvania. He said that halfway through their season, they are basically starting over at this point. And in the post-race piece at SprintCarUnlimited.com, Abreu said, quote, I don't give a shit anymore. I'm just going to go as uh, hard as I can, and I'm not worrying about anything else or any other driver, unquote. The mindset certainly paid off on Tuesday night with the win. As a fan of Rico's and as a sprint car fan, I hope this kickstarts his 2022 season. I believe that with Rico's personality, his driving style, and his acumen when it comes to marketing and promotion, that Sprinkler Racing is just in a better place when he's running well and picking up wins. So hopefully more to come here from Rico. Elsewhere last night, the Summer Nationals and Modified Nationals took on Red Hill Raceway for the first time in nearly 18 years. In late model feature, it was all Tyler Erb out front. He led all 30 laps and held off Brian Shirley right at the line to score his fourth career series win and $5,000. Points later, Bobby Pierce ended the night 13th and with a DNF when the engine on his 32 machine expired in dramatic fashion on lap 16. We're talking flames out from underneath the hood. Uh, and he was running second, no less, at the time. It didn't hurt Pierce in the standings, though, as we were missing Ryan Unzicker last night. So the gap back to Shirley, who's up to second now, is 72 points. At this moment, we are down to just five drivers that have made every Summer Nationals feature. They are Pierce, Shirley, Jason Fager, Peyton Freeman, and Joe Godsey. Besides Unzicker, there was also no uh, Logan Martin last night. 
In the modified main event, Nick Hoffman busted his uh, huge two-race losing streak, leaving all but one lap to take his eighth win of the season. He continues to lead that championship by 136 points over Kyle Steffens. Tonight, both series are headed to Benton Speedway in Missouri. And in some Summer Nationals scheduled news, officials announced yesterday that the July 5th racing at Charleston Speedway has been canceled due to, quote, unforeseen circumstances, unquote. I don't know what that means. Next week's racing will now kick off on July 6th at Fayette County. If you want to see more about uh, Summer Nationals as a whole, that release, you can find that stuff over at DirtCarSummerNationals.com. And sticking with the World Racing Group theme, your Dirt Vision Fast Pass got just a little bit better yesterday with the addition of the USA Nationals at Cedar Lake to the monthly plan. Previously, you could only watch the World of Outlaws Late Model event at Cedar Lake on a yearly Fast Pass or if you paid for it separately as pay-per-view. That leaves now just two events you can't watch for the year on a monthly plan. They are the 360 and 410 Nationals at Knoxville. Those races will be available to you, though, if you have a yearly pass. And I know you guys in the comments are going to tell me, just like folks try and tell Dirt Vision all the time, that not including those races doesn't make sense. But actually, when you look at the numbers, it makes a lot of sense why they do this. A yearly pass for Dirt Vision is $299.99, whereas a monthly pass is $39.99. So if you do an entire year with monthly billing, you'll actually spend a lot more, $479.88 to be exact. So $479 on a monthly plan versus $299, about $300 on a yearly plan. So why then would it seem that you get less for more money? And the answer here is that a lot of monthly subscribers to these services, not only Duravision, but like literally any subscription service that offers a monthly plan, they come and go. They do not average 12 months in a year on these plans, so it's actually more lucrative for the streamers to have you on a yearly plan with guaranteed revenue versus a monthly plan with a higher price, but a much less chance of you staying on for the entire year. So you pay a little bit more for that ability to come and go as you want. And the way the math works out, the yearly is more valuable to them and a bigger revenue driver, so they can give you more in terms of things like Cedar, uh, you know, the USA Nationals at Cedar Lake or the Knoxville Nationals versus the more expensive monthly plan where they're probably not going to make as much money off of you in terms of a year. And this gets into the territory of things like monthly recurring revenue, subscriber lifetime value, revenue per subscriber, and churn rates, things like that. But even if you don't care about any of the stats and any of the numbers, the good news here is, is more racing to watch on Dervision. Before we close out, I wanted to address an email I had yesterday regarding Grandview Speedway and their social media accounts, namely Twitter. This emailer referenced my recent rant about tracks not doing enough to help themselves and mentioned that the Grandview Twitter account hadn't been updated since 2019. This person had gone to the account looking for PA Speedweek details for their show last night and found none. Uh, and they are correct. The track Twitter account is old and the website is broken, so it's it would be difficult to go find stuff for them. There is a Grandview Facebook page that is active, but it appears to be controlled by fans and not the track itself. So here's where things get a little weird and a little nuanced. A lot of the racing at Grandview is promoted by Bob Miller and his Thunder on the Hill series, and that entity has its own social media accounts and website. So there were updates and info last night coming out of Grandview, but they were happening on Twitter at T-O-T-H Racing, looks like at Toth Racing. But the account doesn't come up when you search Grandview because the only mention of Grandview in that account's Twitter bio is a link to Grandview's Twitter account, which is at GView Speedway. So the word Grandview, uh, you know, and, and mention of the Grandview Speedway does not appear anywhere on that page. So on the positive side, they do have a website and active accounts, but they're hard to find unless you know how Grandview works. And obviously that's bad. This is just one of the many examples of the weirdness and nuance and issues that surround these tracks promoting themselves and where they just need to be better. Uh, in other dirt racing shows this week, you can hear Logan Seavey on Loud Pedal, Reese Moran on Passing Points, Brandon Wimmer on the Dirt from Knoxville, JJ Riggins is on for part two with Quick Time, Dale Jr. is on the All Gas No Breaks podcast on their new episodes of the Dirt Reporters, the Dirt Nerds, and Dirt Tracks and Rib Racks. Uh, if you'd like to check out these shows and more, head over to dirttracker.com slash podcasts. And there are nine shows on the streaming uh, streaming schedules today across the services. Dirt Vision has Micros from Millbridge and the Summer Nationals. Flow Racing has PA Speed Week from Port Royal, like I said, plus 410s from Atomic and Flow 24-7. The Cushion also has those same uh, 410s from Atomic. So if you have one of those series, you can watch the racing tonight from Atomic. Uh, Dirt Track Digest has action from Can-Am, and there are two shows over on Speedsport. To see the full daily streaming schedule with links to watch, visit dirttracker.com slash watch tonight. That's it for the show today. Have a good Wednesday. If you have thoughts about the topics on today's show, please leave them in the comments below or tweet at me. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow for more Dirt Tracker Daily.